And I looked around me and I just saw more plastic bags than, than fish. And I was quite disappointed by that. And then I thought, why can't we just clean this up? We're about to launch the world's first ocean cleanup system to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Everything comes down to you know, showing that the technology works. Okay, so uh, Boren, thank you so much for taking the time here in Davos. It's a crazy schedule, isn't it, for you too? Yes. Yeah, so we're, we're sitting on the top floor of this tiny chalet now on a field. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody is ram-packed with meetings. Every minute counts. For sure, yeah. And um, uh, so you, you just came into the room, and I think the quote of the day was already, uh, you've already done it, and I'm just going to repeat it for everybody who's listening, because <laughs> I said that one of my previous, <laughs> one of my previous guests was um, Ross Edgley, right. uh, who swam around the whole of Great Britain in one go, just uh, going onto the boat for sleeping and sure. then swimming all day long for three months. And then your comment was... If you could repeat it, please. Yeah. Well, it's always a relief to see that there's other people that are crazier than I am. Um, quite a relief. Yeah. Where did that... Um, I wanted to go back a little bit because for um, for all of us, you know, finding this purpose and this drive and, and what we're dedicated to in life is mm. a challenge sometimes. I was lucky that I found something very clear. Yeah. Um, but now again in my second life i'm looking searching again right, you know? right, and, right. and that's why and i know most people are, are searching for their purpose mm. as well and i want to touch on on you how i think it's really amazing how so early on you found such a clear direction mm. um and maybe touch a little bit on where those inspirations you think came from what were the what were the first moments which pushed you like so committed into this path of yours yeah i i feel quite um fortunate that i've been able to find my um, my my passion relatively early in life, um, and um, it really came well really quite early uh, when I was uh, two years old. I think I was already uh, building things, making things. So when I was two, the, the first thing that I built was my own chair, like kind of sit on, because I thought it was more fun to sit in your self-built chair than on a chair you could buy. What did it do better than the chair that you can buy? Nothing. Nothing really. But I think it was pretty much ob objectively a worse chair than one you could buy um but it was just the the feeling of you know having an idea you know seeing that picture in your head and then uh being able to 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 make it and to see it in reality and to touch it and to you know that um that to me was really um you know sort of the, the satisfaction and i suppose i've been kind of a you know, creator inventor uh since then so things went from, um, you know, sort of DIY stuff to uh, computers to um, um, you know, explosives. Um, my, my parents especially loved that that phase. Guinness um, World Records? Yeah. So, with, with explosives? <laughs> well, so, so that went to, to, into rocketry. So, the, you know, well, rocketry may be a big, big, big word, but um, just building sort of uh, pressurized rockets. And then uh, indeed when it was um, you know, 12 or 13, I said, well, let's try and launch 213 of them at the same time and um yeah managed to do that and got into the king's, king's book of records and uh yeah so i always really had my 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 projects and just making crazy things it wasn't very useful it was just lots of fun to do and um yeah and then i was 16 went uh, scuba diving in greece looked around me and you know i, I was sort of conditioned to ex expect these these beautiful sceneries like you see in the BBC documentaries and and I looked around me and I just saw more plastic bags than, than fish and I was quite disappointed by that and then I thought why can't we just clean this up and you know can I combine my my passion for um, science and technology making things with you know, this solving this problem that, that I see here. That's that's amazing huh? how one moment like that can be then so significant for for life's course in your yeah. case as well. Things change since then. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, so you, at 16, you decide, OK, I'm dropping out of school or, or education well, and I'm going to make this happen. Like, well, isn't that, that's so courageous. No, like how. Yeah. Did it so take the, a lot of courage or. Well, it, it, it took a year, a year, one and a half before I actually dropped out. So I was still in, um, uh, in, in high school back then and um, decided to first do um, so you had to do this high school science project end of the year 
you basically got 20% of your time to do a project of your choice. And you know, I thought it was amazing. You could you know, use school time to do something you're passionate about. And, um, and then I chose to, to dig into this, this plastic problem and um, uh, you know, studying why people said that it couldn't be cleaned and um, thinking about possible solutions. So, so that took about uh, a year, then um, enrolled in uh, aerospace engineering in, um, at the Delft University of Technology. And then, you know, really, although it, it was you know, really, really quite interesting, I, I still couldn't stop thinking about this, this, this problem. So after half a year, I said, well, let's, um, let's drop out. And uh, you know, if it doesn't work out, I can always come back after a semester and um, and continue the, the studies, uh, but yeah, that that wasn't what happened. I think that's an interesting one. That um, the people who have a lot of courage, they always uh, do keep like a plan B in the back of their head, which they right. build up and make that look like okay, that won't be too bad if that happens. Right. I mean, and that will give you and that gives you courage to try plan A. Sure. And because your fallback is actually not too bad. Did you? So you did that hmm. in a way, yeah. Well, it, it didn't really feel like a very high risk decision um, and um, you know for, first of all about having that backup plan but secondly you know it's very young uh, I don't have a mortgage no family no obligations so really um, yeah it was kind of the the worst thing that could happen I think you know, if you want to do something risky and you know do a startup or anything of the sorts um, really sort of early 20s is actually a really good time to do that Can you take us through a little bit about um, uh, the specifics of the problem? So there's this, uh, of course, the great garbage patch, but why is it so difficult to remove it? And what is the negative impact that it's having um, in, in the great in the Pacific Ocean? Sure. Yeah. So, so plastic pollution is really an issue because of three reasons. First of all, it's, um, it's destroying ecosystems. So there's roughly 800 species negatively impacted by, by plastic pollution right now. Um, then you have the, um, the economic impact. Uh, we just published a paper that showed that it's up to 19 billion dollars per year uh, damaging the, the global economy. When you say we, who, who is that? Um, so it was uh, our uh, science team combined with uh, Deloitte. Okay. So, um, so yeah, it was a few months ago. Yeah. And um, so it's really much cheaper to solve the problem than to not do it. It's just crazy amounts. And um, and then thirdly, what happens is that these um, these these tiny pieces of plastic, they end up in, in fish. And um, what, what these plastic pieces do is that they attract um, toxic chemicals from the surrounding water onto the plastic. So um, so this plastic is almost like a, a toxic pill that um, transports these chemicals into the food chain. And that's, of course, a food chain that also includes us humans. So um, with all these potential health effects uh, associated with that. So it's Uh, but I think it's roughly three billion people that have uh, protein as a really important part of their their diet, or uh, fish as an important uh, um, element of, of their diet, and um, yeah, of course that's um, that's a pretty big deal as well. Is there some numbers out there on on the amount of microplastics already in the average fish that those people consume who are so heavy on on their fish and in, in diets? Is there something? Or? Um, well, so it, de it depends on the species and the the life cycle on the fish. But um, yeah, for some fish, you know, for example, in the, in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, roughly uh, half of the uh, the lantern fish that you see there, which are then being consumed by the bigger fish like the tuna and the swordfish, etc. Uh, they have uh, plastic in them. So it's yeah, it's pretty big amount. So it's pretty bad as it is now huh? and, and as urgent, uh, extremely urgent matter from all those perspectives. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. But then again, I, th I think it's, um, you know, it's it's a bad situation. But first of all, it, it can become much worse because right now we see that um, 92% of the plastics are still large objects. And of course, what happens if we don't clean those up then over the next few decades all of that will also become microplastics and then you have basically 10 times more of, of that stuff out there um, but then on the other hand I also think that it's um, it's a solvable problem and um, you know as long as we you know we remove it and uh, we prevent more stuff from going in which is what we're also working on right now on, on the rivers I think um, you know the the, the, the future you know the ocean can be come clean again so you say it's a solvable problem. At the same time, you have like some of the most renowned scientists hmm. telling you that you're completely full of rubbish <laughs> uh, well, and it's not going to happen and it's not possible right. and he's, he's talking nonsense. So how do you 
deal with that and how do you just how do you have such self-confidence and so much self-belief that you just know and yeah. keep going against all that criticism isn't that hard um so you know maybe one point of um I don't think they were really renowned scientists or of people that, you know, most of their publications were about social media and things like that. So, um, so you know, the, for example, the, the chief scientist, uh, former chief scientist of the, of the NOAA is uh, the American Oceanographic Institute is, um, is, is, is advising us. We have uh, green scientists in the team. So, uh, but still, it, you know, it, it is fair to say that, um, you know, that at the beginning we received uh, a lot of criticism from um you know, basically the entire plastic pollution community saying well you know it's impossible you shouldn't do it and um you know, and then when i you know so so the way I, I i dealt with that was um to really just rationally analyze all the arguments and uh to see well is it based on facts or is it just an assumption or you know is it um uh, is it simply not 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 true and when I did that, I, you know, most of the things were kind of you know, un unfounded. So, uh, for example, people were saying, well, all the plastic is uh, deep in the water column, so you can't get to it, or all of it is microplastics, or, um, you know, things will, will break immediately. Um, and, yeah, I, I, what we did was we basically used those lists of arguments as kind of a, a recipe of the things that we should be working on and should be studying. And basically one by one, we were able to tick them off. And um, yeah, so I, yeah, so, so I think it's important to distinguish between sort of good criticism and bad criticism. And, you know, the good criticism is, um, you know, you should really listen to because, I mean, how silly would it be to, um, to ignore that? Because, you know, the only thing you care about is making this a success. And if somebody else says, well, you know, you should do it this way, not that way. And it's actually, um, you know, a, a good argument. Um, you know, how silly would that be to, to ignore that? Because uh, it, it would only help you, you know, advance your, your, your objective. Uh, but then, you know, unfortunately, that's you know, the kind of criticism that, that's, you know, in the minority. I think, the, you know, the majority is just kind of, um, um, you know, not really truthful or, um, you know, ideology based. Um, for example, um, you know, there is this big point about, well, we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't spend resources on cleaning up. We should just prevent it from going into the ocean. Now, of course, now we are also working on that. We, we do both sides of the equation, intercepting plastic in rivers before it reaches the oceans. Um, but then again, I think humanity can do more than one thing at the same time. And uh, this, this plastic that's in the ocean doesn't go away by itself. So if you want to solve the problem, you have to address that. And um, yeah, and, and I, I suppose that, um, yeah, people didn't really like that. I think it's so strong, the respect that you're able to show your, towards your, critis, uh, your critics, hmm. as you just said now. Like in, in my career, I wasn't strong enough to, to really sit down and have a think about... Um, what the critics are saying and if there's anything that might be founded mm. <laughs> but the way you're using it or seem to use it to your advantage yeah and it's like free advice in the end exactly from, from someone exactly. who might actually know something right um that's awesome yeah that's really strong yeah there should be more good criticism so keep it coming yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so dear dear right. critics keep it coming right it's only yeah. making you stronger yeah. and it's only going to help you exactly. good criticism not not the bad criticism. yeah of no. course yeah. <laughs> um can you take us through like the most challenging period for you um, and what did you learn in right. that period about yourself, about mm. what you were doing? Yeah. So um, one year ago, so we um, to, to give a bit of history. Um, you know, so past few years, we uh, we've been working on developing the system to clean the plastic from from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. After all those years of work, we finally launched the system September 2018. And one month later, we realized, okay, it's, it's not catching plastic. So what we saw was that the system was moving at roughly the same speed as the plastic, which meant that the plastic wasn't coming in. And um, and then, you know, we thought, okay, that's that's pretty bad, but uh, okay, we, we can learn from this and see how we can adjust it. Uh, it can't be much worse than this. And then, of course, <laughs> it, it did become uh, come worse where uh, just before New Year's uh, 2019, the, um, the system actually uh, broke into two. So an 18 meter end section disconnected from the rest of the system. 
and uh, which forces us to to tow the system back back to land. Man, that's hard. And um, so exactly a year ago, you know, we're sitting in in the office, just thinking, "Wow, okay, <laughs> we just um, spent so much time and energy and resources on 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 this this first system, and it was really kind of this make or break moment, and well, literally <laughs> broke." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so so really. Um, yeah, that that was that was a tough moment to um, kind of not be influenced by emotions too much and uh, by really um, trying to uh, you know, think of a, a rational course forward to uh, to see how we uh, you know, can um, uh, you know, uh, resolve it. So I think it was um, you know a few days of like, really. A few really dark days, and then uh, fortunately, you know, there's so much energy in the team as well that that kind of um, you know, uh, helped each other. We, I think we really helped each other there to, uh, you know, basically say, okay, let's look at this. What were the causes? Let's rationally analyze it, and um, you know, do the root cause analysis. Like go back to the drawing board, and um, you know, let's give it another try. And um, yeah, fortunately. We, um, you know, half a year later, we finally managed to to catch the first plastic. But yeah, one year ago, it's really bad. <laughs> bad it's, day. Jeez, um, it's nice. I think you 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 you're such a calculator with everything, mm. even like with cor- like a- action course and everything. Mm. So I think your your power really seems to be in preparation. Um, like you you extract such confidence from being prepared huh? for for any action course that you're about to take with the company and right is that is that the case yeah well it's kind of the, the only way is forward right and um yeah it's um yeah it's just about you know looking at yeah, every moment thinking okay what's the best action i could take right now what has the highest leverage what is the highest chance of success and um you know realizing that a lot of it has to be trial and error and that you know the most of the lessons you get sort of the the hard way and the the painful way and um failures are the best opportunities to grow and improve and become better right um yeah unless so, they're too big yes <laughs> we don't want to those ones. no so there is yeah that's it's kind of um there's oh, good and bad failures <laughs> right it's this uh in silica valley there's there's almost this so this the strange love affair with failure, where um, people say failure is good. Well, failure is still bad; you shouldn't <laughs> fail. Um, but of course, if there is a failure, um, you should try and learn as much of it uh, of from it as 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 possible. Yeah. What did you? What you have like eighty employees now, or is um, that right? About a hundred now. About a hundred, yeah. huh? Yeah. So how? What do you do to? keep them inspired in such a moment of huge failure where to them because they probably don't have the vision that you do or the mm. confidence that you do to them it's the end this is not going to happen the critics are the, the good critics are right <laughs> and the bad critics everybody's right, right. yes this is not going to happen what do you do in that moment to to keep them motivated and, and keep the inspiration in them going was there something particular that you can remember that you that you did mm. i think a lot of it is just about leading by example um yeah just um I think most pe- most things fail because people give up too early. Um, so it's just about you know, keeping going and you know, never giving up. And um, yeah, just showing, you know, sort of radiating you know, confidence and um, you know, uh, a, a positive attitude towards it. I think that um, yeah, that helps the team and um, and also just. Um, yeah, this is something I I, I learned, I suppose, too recently is that it's also really important to not always position yourself as the person with the solutions, but also kind of giving it back to the team. Okay, so how would you solve it? And um, because you know, giving um, you know, giving people responsibility um, actually um, you know, empowers them to to do great work. That's a, that's something that I've just learned as well because I have a I have a small group of group of employees now much mm. smaller than yours but we're like 15 or 16 now in in monaco as well working right. on all my different uh, uh, initiatives and, and businesses uh, very focused on on um, environment as well mm. and um of course they always really ask like make sure the vi- they want to have a very clear vision right 
um, and I'm always trying, like I'm always forcing myself to give a very clear vision, mm-hmm. but but sometimes I don't have it actually. Mm. So I'll be I'll be thinking about what you say now, right. and maybe just also admit uh, that sometimes I don't have the clear vision, and I'm welcome. I welcome uh, input. And yeah, that, that's that's a cool thought. Well, there's a certain sense of uh, yeah, humility and you yeah. know, showing you know your vulnerability and saying I don't know everything, and yeah. um, and I think it's especially hard to make the transition for sort of tech oriented founders because um you know you are programmed as an inventor and engineer to <laughs> find <laughs> solutions to, to to problems right and yeah. um and then to um you know to say to your team well okay i don't have the solution right now what do you think should be the solution that's um a really hard transition but it's important because eventually especially with 100 people it's not about uh, it's not only about what's the best idea ideas coming from my brain, but it's really about how do I make sure that we get all the best ideas out of all these hundred brains because yeah, you know, they are much smarter than than I am. It's incredible the skill set that's required from from you in that case. You need to be the best inventor. You need to be the best leader. You need to know how to how mm. to sell and market things, which you do really well as well mm. on social media. I mean, it's amazing content. Um, so you really need to be so multifaceted mm. to be able to have success. Uh, yeah, no, I, I suppose I'm quite a, a, a generalist in that um, I also actually really enjoy um, switching from very different kind of problems throughout yeah. the day. You know, yeah. one point in time you're sitting in a meeting about recycling, you're talking about you know co- covalent bonds and some chemistry stuff, yeah. um, and the next moment it's it's about you know com- communication. Next moment is about uh, yeah. production or you know structural engineering, and um, yeah, just. I, that's you know part of my sort of job that I enjoy most. Yeah. I would I would I would say that that's one of your greatest. Uh, I think that's pro- possibly your greatest asset that you're such a generalist. And I would like to take Elon Musk as an example as well, because mm. it's not it's rare that an engineer is able to be a, a such a great storyteller as well. Mm. For example, and Elon Musk is an unbelievable engineer he does that and really an well. unbelievable right. storyteller and marketeer. Right. And it's the combination which has made uh, Tesla into such a force. With yeah. such a following and, and to take on such an industry, hmm. I think that's something probably that you uh, that you are are similar. You don't well, need to confirm, but I'm sure that you're very it, similar in that sense. I think it's just about doing what's um, you know, what's the best thing or what's the most important thing for um, the um, for the mission. And um, you know, it, it's important to realize if you want something to be successful, you know, there's always these two sides. You know, you have the the making it happen, and you know, so the supply and the demand side basically and um you know just like with with tesla um you know people so they need to build great products but they also need to have you know the world wanting the, those great products and i mean same thing is here if nobody cares about cleaning the ocean um it's not going to happen so it's really important that a lot of people care about it and spread the word and you know help donate and find supporters and partners where can so, uh, my my listeners uh, donate Oh, well, so the I'll, ocean... ju- I'll join in at the same, <laughs> Thanks. <on> the same go. <laughs> uh, so on theoceancleaner.com, um, you, um, yeah, all the information is there. So uh, thanks for, for your help there. So we're all going to donate. Um, That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> Support so, you on the next push. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, but maybe c- coming back to the uh, sort of the generalist point. So, um, yeah, it, it's just about um, being so passionate about the goal that you, you know, are ca- kind of, able to learn yourself all the skills that that you need to do um you know you i, th- I think every listener is familiar with you know for example in, in school there's things that interest you things that don't interest you how ha- how hard it is to learn things or to try and learn things that don't interest you oh my goodness it's, it's really difficult so um you know so by being extremely passionate about the thing you're working on um you know there's all these sub components that may be very different disciplines but you'll be able to familiar familiarize yourself with them just because you're you're passionate about it so what was the most dry and horrible book that you had to get get through recent, <laughs> recently oh <laughs> um I, 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 I most of my books aren't very uh, well they may be dry but not really hard to get through <laughs> no because well, you said some areas are just not interesting but you have to you have to get through them and oh, learn no, no, to my, become an expert, even in that space. Well, my point is more that you know, if you're passionate about the overarching objective, well, uh, it's not hard to do those okay, things. Okay. Um, 
in my in my experience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And uh, when I called you, um, I think it was the end of last. No, we we emailed. I think the end of last year. Yeah. You said, uh, Nico, it's all it's all great. Thank you very much for all, for your invitation. But I'm very sorry, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to attend anything because I have to put in a hundred hour weeks at the moment to yeah. try and get this beta system to be a success. Um, right <laughs> towards the end of towards the end of 2019 yeah sorry for declining that but no, no, <laughs> no but how do you i mean isn't do you do you manage to keep some balance in in such a insane workload that you that you put into that no <laughs> no I, I completely out of balance what, well uh, i don't even know what balance means to be honest but uh no i think yeah of course yeah it's um you know, sure, surely again i suppose it's more of a a symptom from being passionate about it than you know really um you know, something fundamental but um yeah i mean i think f for most if not all great work you just have to put in a lot of time and effort and um um yeah just last year you know it was such a make or break year i mean if that beta system wouldn't have functioned um uh you know we would be in pretty dodgy situation right now i think and you know, with the river systems um you know, if, if that we didn't pull it off so actually that's another thing like one year ago uh so i think as you know so we're, we're doing these two things in parallel cleaning up what's already in the ocean intercepting in rivers what's um uh, not yet reached the ocean to prevent it from going into the ocean and a year ago we so we were already working on those two projects and on the ocean no, the system failed and on the riverside we had uh, we had exactly one system which had been stuck in customs for a year already <sighs> in indonesia so um so really <laughs> it was even worse than probably people saw from from the outside but then we managed to get it out and now with two systems operational thousands of kilos of day per day uh, being extracted from rivers and um and the ocean system um yeah, managed to to get that to work, but yeah, really on both fronts, it was a break a break year last year, and it was just important to to not have um, any distractions. But um, yeah, I, 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 I actually it was the first time, sort of end of last year, that I felt personally that I've even reached a limit. That was <laughs> that happens. Boyan has a limit. Well, I, <laughs> I didn't actually didn't know that was possible because you know, it doesn't really feel when you're passionate about something, it doesn't really feel like work. And I was just, it was, um, and suddenly <laughs> it, it did feel like work and that was quite, um, disconcerting to me. And, um, yeah. So, so then like last two weeks of the year, I just took off and just read a bunch of books and, uh, yeah, that, that was really quite necessary because it was a really difficult year, but again, looking back, it, I think it was, it was worth it. So one more common theme there, I think you see across all incredible leaders is uh, is reading. Uh, I think it's so mm. powerful, and I'm pushing myself as well to read as much as I can on, on just personal development books and and books that are relevant to to the mission that you're Great. that you want to undertake. So I think that's another important lesson to the to the listener. Um, final words then, can you say what you wish for your success now to look like? In in I mean, of course, without going into too much detail, but where's your um, you're you're deploying your first full system. Hmm. When is that going to happen, and what do you hope that that's going to be able to achieve in the Pacific Ocean? Yeah. Um, so um, so yeah, on the ocean side, the um, yeah the, the the system I think will take roughly a year to uh, to to be ready for that. So so this year will fully just be dedicated to developing what we call System Two, which will be the first full scale fully operational cleanup system and will kind of be this blueprint for the whole fleet of systems that we need to deploy to really clean the whole patch. And um, so that's going to be this year. Uh, so probably deployment next year. And then on the uh, the river side, we, we now have two systems operational and then aim to to scale this up to um, another you know, dozen or so systems by the end of the year. And um, so throughout Southeast Asia and Central America, and um, yeah, that should put us on track to hopefully have a thousand of these systems uh, in the ocean or in the in all the rivers by um, 2025, which should stop 80% of all plastic going to the ocean from actually reaching the ocean. So um, 
few busy years ahead for sure. <laughs> and then soon we'll be we'll be able to buy awesome products as well, right? Or are they already yeah. available from yeah. your from your plastic that you gathered? Exactly. So that's that's actually the third thing that that we're working on is um, because I think the one of the main problems is that plastic doesn't have any value. So uh, by by using the uh, the story of the cleanup to create value, uh, emotional value to this material. Uh, we hope to actually create sort of this business model to keep the cleanup going. And um, we'll be trying this out this year. So in September, we'll be launching the first product, 100% made from plastic from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. I'll cover it on my uh, social media as well then. That I'll, I'll, be most you, I'll support yeah. you with the launch. Brilliant. And um, yeah, and actually people can already um, kind of uh, claim their their seat in, in line on our website for mm. for that first product. We haven't shared what the product is, uh, but um, yeah, if you want to put money in something you don't know what it's going to be, this is your opportunity. <laughs> so you already you already have a queue of people <laughs> yeah, waiting I, for a product that they don't know what it is. I think it's about That's six, pretty, six thousand people have now put exciting. money in for amazing. How much how much do I have to put? Uh, 50, to be bucks. In line. 50 bucks. Fifty bucks and I get bucks. to be the six thousand and first. <laughs> yes, to um and yeah, I think you know, we, we only have a limited amount of products that we can um, uh, launch in September because we only have a limited amount of plastic now because it's just a beta system. So, um, yeah, so definitely if you want to make sure that you don't miss the boat, um, you know, recommend si signing up now. Yeah, but this yeah. is even better. It's the first limited edition batch. It's the this first ever special. plastic from the Great Pacific ultra Garbage Patch. Ultra special, not to miss out on. You can you can own a piece of the Garbage Patch. <laughs> Who doesn't want that? And it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful, sustainable product. So, um, yeah, that, so that will be, yeah, it's pretty exciting too. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much, Boyan. I think everybody uh, loved, uh, loved the inspiration and all the insights you, you gave. Are you a big Max Verstappen fan then, being Dutch? Oh, yeah, I was watch. Yeah, uh, big supporter. Uh, yeah. He's amazing, huh? Quite, quite, yeah. It's, um, yeah, he's pretty aggressive, but um, yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a joy to watch, especially if he starts at the back. It's <laughs> amazing. The field, it's, awesome. Uh, awesome. Yeah, it's quite yeah. special. Uh, yeah. When when he goes out of the race, you you know that the race is only going to be half as exciting. Right. So right. it's always a, if he goes out, it's always a huge disappointment for everybody. Very true. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think it's going to be cool to watch the the he's like the new generation yeah. against the old generation, right. which is Lewis Hamilton. Yeah. Could be that this is the year. Where they really right. go head to head. Right. If Max gets the car good enough That's from Red Bull, yeah. so I think it could be an epic uh, F1 season. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, cheers. Bye bye, everybody.